Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Pound for Pound Boxing Report, episode 155. I'm your host, Michael. Joining me this week, Gail Falkenthal, Community Digital News, uh, Jacob Rivera from Jab Book Boxing, uh, both from Truth and Facts Boxing, as well as Daniel Carpio from The Inscriber. What's going on, ladies and gents? Evening, Good everybody. Morning. Hello. Good morning. For those, new pound for, pound, for those new to the Pound for Pound Box Report, Pound for Pound Box Report is a uh, podcast as well as live a YouTube show and blog discussing all things boxing. Modern wisdom when boxing is good, we will talk about it. When it's bad, we will talk about it. Bottom line is, if it concerns boxing, we will talk about it. If you want to find out more information about the Pound for Pound Box Report, just check out one main place. That's the blog page, p4pboxingreport.wordpress.com is the link. Uh, check the writer blog page. You will find links to find all our pages all over social media, Tumblr, Facebook, and G+, as well as links to where to listen to us on SoundCloud, iTunes, uh, Player.fm, Stitch Radio, uh, Google Play Music. Um, let's get the show started tonight. No real fights happening this weekend. No real fights of note, I should say. So I want to go straight into the news and kind of have a follow-up conversation on a topic that we talked about last week regarding the kind of the back, the behind the scenes backroom dealings of both Golden Boy and, and Al Heyman PBC, as you know, um, there was a lawsuit, antitrust lawsuit filed by um, Golden Boy against um, Heyman. Well, breaking news, um, as just really a few minutes ago, maybe an hour at the most, um, the lawsuit has been uh, dropped. Um, I'll go to you, uh, Gail and, and Bo, since you both shared it with me. Uh, Has it been dropped or thrown out? Thrown out, excuse me. You're right. Thrown, thrown out. out. Thrown out. Yep. I will go to you, Gail and, and Bo, since you were the ones who shared it with me just prior to, just right before the show began. Um, some, deal t- some details mm-hmm. about this. Um, big L for Golden Boy and a big W here for Heyman. Yeah. Well, to well, make it clear what happened, the judge hearing the case, which is a district court judge. Deal t- deal t- deal t- uh, yeah, I see Francis and Joe are joining us from Four Boxing. Uh, proceed, yeah. Okay. Uh, the, the judge uh, hearing the case, the U.S. District Court Judge John F. Walter, issued a summary judgment today <coughs> late. It is against Golden Boy. Uh, essentially, the ruling says that Golden Boy's civil suit is tossed out of court because it doesn't have enough merit to go to a full trial. Most judges in most courts try to avoid full-blown trials. They are expensive. Uh, this is taxpayer money. They want to make sure both sides have a real bona fide bone to pick, that there's enough evidence to chew over that either a jury or if it's a bench trial, which means the judge is also the jury, you know, has enough facts to sift through. There, there's something real to argue about. And we've gotten to this point where the judge says, nope, not enough merit means there's not enough there's not enough to argue over here. There's not enough to go to trial. So that's a that's it, that's an L for Golden Boy. Now, Golden Boy Promotions has the right to file an appeal. They need to think long and hard about that because this gets to the point of do you want to throw good money after bad? Do you want to keep paying your lawyers who are no doubt billing very expensive hourly rate to Golden Boy, you know, if you're going to throw more money against this, what are you going to get from it? Um, This was an allegation in civil court, not a criminal court, by Golden Boy, uh, filed uh, two years ago, almost two years ago, last uh, summer 2015, alleging that Al Heyman and Premier Boxing Champions had violated what's called the Muhammad Ali Boxing Reform Act. Um, This is the civil regulations that prohibit somebody being in business both as a manager and a promoter in boxing. It's essentially trying to prohibit a monopoly. Um, The judge is saying not that it isn't true necessarily. What the judge is saying is there's not enough evidence to conduct a lawsuit. Golden Boy, you haven't brought me enough facts to argue over proving whether this is true or not. Uh, uh, you know, and, and as typical, uh, Heyman and his folks didn't have any comment. Al Heyman very rarely speaks to the media, so that's not unexpected. Uh, and as we have all seen, uh, 
in the last 48 hours, uh, Oscar's had other issues to deal with of a personal nature. So nothing's come from them yet either. Um, absolutely. And I'll go to you, Bo. Um, I'll mute your mic, brother. Um, it's, it's not only this. Um, it's the recent personal development regarding De La Hoya. And another article that you shared with me, I believe, yesterday, um, kind of damning, if you will, towards Golden Boy. So talk about all that, the, 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 the case being... Um, thrown out uh, the recent developments regarding Golden, regarding De La Hoya of Golden Boy. And for those who don't know, uh, news broke yesterday that uh, Master De La Hoya was arrested for DUI, as well as the article you shared with me. Oh, sure. Can, can everybody hear me? Can everybody hear me pretty good? Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, Gail, they just, um, BoxingScene.com, Gail, just posted an article from... Um, Heyman's people, they, they just gave a statement, like just now. They just posted an article of them giving the statement. Um, but the article that I posted to you, what it was was outside of, we all know about the, the racial emails back and forth, but what it also showed was Oscar De La Hoya and them had a full-fledged smear campaign going against PBC. And I'm going, I'm going to try to be as brief as possible, but let me give people a little background here because I think – uh, to sort of explain, because people want to say, oh, they're doing this against Al Hanging because he's black. No. Let me give you a background here. Uh, Richard Schaefer and Golden Boy started Golden Boy Promotions. Then Oscar brought in Bernard Hopkins and he brought in Mosley. And Schaefer probably felt like he was going to be pushed out, whatever the case may be. But when Oscar went through rehab, there was contracts that expired on 19 fighters, including Broner, Porter, Thurman, Garcia, Madonna, et cetera. And instead of them having lengthy contracts with Golden Boy, they was on fight-by-fight based contracts. So this happened while Oscar was in rehab. Then Oscar comes out of rehab. He tries to make amends with Am. Schaefer doesn't want to. And he leaves, pretty much goes to leave Golden Boy. They go through a lengthy lawsuit to which Al Heyman paid $10 million in legal fees and, and all of that for Schaefer and wound up getting all of these fighters. So I, I'm saying that to say that, you know, uh, to a certain degree, there is a legitimate amount of dislike for Heyman from Golden Boy because of what transpired during his time of rehab and in and out of rehab and how he lost his fighters in what manner, in shape, form, and fashion. So he starts PBC, and of course we know the lawsuit went through, but they went on an all-out smear campaign. They were uh, advising other newspaper articles to only put out negative stuff. They had hired investigators to say, hey, if there's anything that you hear about that's private, uh, you know, that, that, that you hear about private for, for uh, PBC, put it, you know, tell us if we're going to blast it out there and put it out there. And this was just a, a full-fledged smear campaign against them. And it goes to an, a statement that was made on behalf of Heyman them, which was, we just don't want to use the emails because of the, the racial content. We want to use the emails to also prove, uh, you know, this intent to p- go after us publicly and falsely accuse us of things. And as it turned out, according to the emails, that some of that validity is, is very, very much so true. Then Oscar gets to DUI. I think they say he blew 0.08 or higher. He couldn't pass none of the sobriety tests. That, again, was like a really bad sign. And then, of course, you had this, um, this take place. And I remember saying this to people. I said, listen, when top rank, part of the antitrust fund that they had against uh, PBC, top rank had, got thrown out. Okay, when that got thrown out, I knew then that Golden Boy had a slim chance because part of their bases was the same thing with the top rank was. And uh, you, you have to have document proof that Al Heyman was both promoter and manager. And if you look at one very critical piece of evidence in the email that I sent you, where it says that Al Heyman, we had the contracts with NBC, ESPN, and all of them, it specifically stated they would only promote fights if it was done with a duly licensed promoter which Al Heyman was not a licensed promoter. So that was the evidence right there that he wasn't a promoter and a manager. So it's an L for De La Hoya, but let, let, me, let, let me say this. I personally, these last couple of days between Angel Garcia, the Golden Boy emails, these lawsuits, I personally, although I, 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 I'm, I feel that, okay, thank God it's over, but I personally don't like these things because these are things that take away from the sport of boxing. We have, you know, we got some fights coming up this weekend, 
and 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 you know De La Hoya just out ESPN, and it's going to be overshadowed by this kind of news. And I think that's sad because you got guys training their butts off in the gym. It's going to be overshadowed by news like this. So hopefully this is over. And I agree with Gail. Golden Boy can't appeal, but if you don't have the same proof that this got tossed out, then do you want to waste your money like this, knowing the financial difficulties that you're in right now going forward? So thank God this is over. Hopefully now we can really get the boxing and focus on the fights. And maybe, you know, everyone can put their differences aside and actually work together and make good fights. Um, I'm going to expand the, uh, the, the conversation here, include everyone, um, Francis and Joe from Four Boxing, um, Daniel and Jacob. Um, in light of what uh, Gail and Bo just disclosed, uh, your reaction started with you, uh, Francis from Four Boxing. Um, I'm actually not surprised by the outcome of the, uh, the summary judgment because it seemed as though Golden Boy didn't have enough evidence um, for this to proceed to trial. Joe and I actually read uh, some of the legal documentation today. There's a civil minutes dated January 26th today. Um, and we read through it a little bit. And I still think, I still think there are loopholes here and there in the case. Specifically, Burbage saying that none of the fighters in Haven's camp ever felt coerced into not working with other um, with other promoters. I'm not so sure. Uh, I'm not so sure about that because I feel that okay. Um... They never actually. It, Okay, uh, right. Francis, I'm, 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 I'm getting a little bit of static, a lot of static oh, okay. from your end. So what you might have to do is uh, reboot and, and come back on. Okay. And because of that, I'm going to uh, I'm going to go with Daniel and then um, Jacob. Your reaction to uh, all these developments? It was expected, given like what Bo mentioned, when top rank, when that antitrust part fell, it was pretty weak and like. It was a weak lawsuit when that came out. But another thing, honestly, that I'm reading that the judge cited as a reason for this is actually Canelo Khan and Canelo Chavez because part of the argument that Golden Boy put out was that Al Heyman only wants to work with Al Heyman fighters and Al Heyman promoters. He doesn't want to, he's not going to go outside unless he has to. Particularly in this sense, in the Chavez fight, probably is what ultimately did it this big because Golden Boy made a, such a big deal of it. And he cited as part of that argument saying, well, you really can't say that Al Heyman doesn't work with other promoters. You're working with them. So it was pretty understandable that, they got, that it got thrown out. Of all the lawsuits, it, Golden Boy was probably the weakest. And like I said, they do have the right to appeal. I don't think, given like what's surrounding them now with Oscar, that they should appeal. They should probably just leave it as it is, take take the loss, and leave it as it may. Because right now, like the lawsuits are probably going to end our Heyman. A lot of the finances are going to undo Heyman by itself if, if that's your goal. But ultimately... When I read the emails of the smear campaign, that's that pretty much read like a political campaign. When you're particularly aiming at a then Attorney General Kamala Harris, at members of the California Senate, California State Assembly that would be favorable to you, going into going out to papers, that's that's a polit that's a political campaign. You're, you're gonna get favor. You're gonna try to do things. That's what I. Pre that's normal to me when it comes to when you go to try to get a, when you try to do a political type of campaign where you're going to sway opinion one way or another. The emails, like I said, that came out didn't help. The fights are gonna create by themselves because now, 
if Voldemort does choose to appeal, which, like I said, uh, if, if John Francis come back, them being uh, them being lawyers and paralegal, they'll probably say flat out, there's there should be no way for them to to actually go with the appeal. But if they do, then they leg- they can't really win because not only do you have the Canelo Khan, you have another thing that came out recent, like that we spoke about last week, which is the television deal with ESPN. Golden Boy could no longer say at that point, we're being locked out of network TV, of basic cable by Al Heyman. Because ESPN just made a deal with you. And you have those two fights going along with it. It was a weak case. Hopefully Golden Boy moves moves along with it and lets it drop. And I said, if if Heyman's gonna be undone, it's gonna be he's gonna be undone most likely by finances within the PVC. That's pretty much all I can leave it out. Okay. Uh I'll go to you on this one, Jacob. Your thoughts on this and, and speak to uh Bo's point about how this as well as the stuff with Angel Garcia and whatnot, it's kind of uh taking away the focus um from what's in the ring because uh as face we got a big weekend coming up and the topic of conversation uh, throughout this week has been either uh, articles in, in response to the ignorance of Angel Garcia or these breaking developments with uh, uh, Golden Boy and PBC and Oscar De La Hoya specifically. Yeah. Uh, well, first first and foremost, fuck Angel Garcia. He guys a moron. <laughs> so, I, you know, and I was actually glad that, you know, I'm not a big Dan Raphael fan, but he did write an article about, you know, how unacceptable, like everything that he did. And hopefully, you know, from what I see, there's a lot of like uh, pushback for that. And, you know, hopefully they, they do something, um, whether it's banning him from these type of press conferences or fines or whatever to get him to shut up. Um, Next thing is uh, I can't really elaborate anymore on the, on the situation. I haven't been following as closely, um, but I'll reiterate what Bo said before. Um, at the end of the day, I, I love the sport of boxing, as does everybody on the panel. And, you know, coming off a, a weekend like we had, beginning of 2017 with the Gell, uh, Jack, and, you know, just that, that whole card in general, you hate to see these things happen um, because he's right. It takes the shine off of, you know, good boxing that's coming up. And... You know, at the end of the day, I just want to see the best fight the best. I want, you know, I, I'm i not saying I'm a, you know, uh, I'm not a supporter of, you know, uh, only Golden Boy or only Top Rank or only uh, PBC. Like, I want to give them all the opportunity to do what they can do and hopefully make the best fights. I've been to all their different promotions. And, you know, if they're in my area, I, I want to support those fights and, um, I understand it's a business and, and whatnot, but uh, um, the last thing I want to say about it is for all those rich people out there, celebrities, if you're going to do drugs, drink and drive, buy a hooker, you know what? You got all these, the entourage, have them fucking do it for you. I, I, I can't, it, it baffles me that these people keep on getting caught doing these stupid things when they have somebody, I'm sure, by their side that can drive them, go buy their drugs, go buy their hookers, do all the dirty work for them, and then they don't have to be connected to this. So, you know, Oscar is in for, you know, a, a, a bad week. And I had said it before in the show, if uh, Chavez pulls out this uh, a surprise knockout of his golden, um, you know, cow, it could be a bad first half of the year for Golden Boy Promotions. Um, I'll go back to you, Gail and Bo. Uh, uh, you want to wrap all this up? Uh, since um, really, I, I got the news and all this from you guys. Uh, you want to give a, a wrap up to all this uh, news with Golden Boy and Heyman and, and De La Hoya? In my opinion, Golden Boy needs to cut their losses, move on, uh, focus on making their new contract with ESPN a huge success, whatever it takes. People are very excited about that. Move pos- move forward with the positive 
let this lawsuit go, pay off the lawyers and send them home and use your energy to the, to the positive of the sport. Give your, you know, give your prospects, you know, a new place to improve their craft. And with luck, this is where you're going to find the next Canelo, where you're going to find the next Floyd, where you're going to find the next talent um, coming out of your really terrific, you know, class A farm team that you, you know, had performing at the Belasco. Cherry pick off the great performers, give them that television exposure, see who rises to the occasion. Eyes forward, guys. Eyes forward. Um, I see EJ Boxing Live has joined us. Um, I'm Mutual Mike, brother. We're talking about um, the breaking news uh, with the case uh, being um, thrown out uh, against Al Heyman from Go the Golden Boy antitrust oh, yeah. case being thrown out. Uh, no bro news just broke just a, not too long ago. Uh, it's been a while since you've been here. We talked about this last week, uh, kind of the backroom dealings of all that and whatnot. Uh, your thoughts on all this? Well, you can see why they, they had the racist uh, emails going back and forwards. So they probably knew they lost the lost. <laughs> they probably knew they lost the case. And um, and there's another thing as why well, uh, Oscar La Hoya got a, what's it, a DUI. Yeah. Um, drinking under the influence. <laughs> That's probably why as well. So this news is probably they probably knew this was going to happen beforehand. And um, I, as Oscar crashed into the thing, car crash TV, man. And look, man, end of the day, we all knew it was stupid. We knew what they were trying to do, trying to get leverage, trying to stop him. They had no, in my opinion, no reason for them to try and do that. Al Heyman simply as a business, um, trying to get a product out there, trying to put boxing back on free TV. And listen, it's been su it's successful. As we know, tomorrow night will be, um, not tomorrow night, in two days' time, we'll be watching um, Santa Cruz and um, Carl Frampton too. And um, obviously, just the other day as well, we had a, a great PVC fight as well. So we've had some good PVC fights so far. And, you know, get to the point like, and we're just used to it. Now we're used to getting our free TV. We, we know we can pay for it. We want to. And there's enough boxing exposure. Over here in, um, in the UK, we've got ITV, uh, pay-per-view with Eubank Jr. Um, and a lot of celebrities. Andre Ward will be coming over. I actually just got my press credentials for that. So I will be attending the press conference. And hopefully uh, me and Andre Ward have a catch up and talk about the Kolova fight. So, you know, boxing is very... Boxing is spreading out both both sides of the ponds. And... Um, for De La Hoya, you know, he needs to, he needs to, you know, get over it and just concentrate on, 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 on working on getting new talents. And hopefully he can do that because um, we need Golden Boy and we like we need um, Bob Arum in the sport. I know, and like you know, sometimes we don't agree with him, but it's competition and competition is good for the sport. So this is good for the PBC and it's good for boxing. Uh, final word on this, Bo. Yeah. Um... Final word is that like like uh, we do. Let's, I don't want to see any entity fail. I don't want to see any entity go away because it takes from the sport that I love and also participate in in the amateur. So, uh, I, Gail said it, it. Gail said it eloquently. You know, cut your losses, look eyes forward, and you know, hopefully all of them can work together and give us even greater fights in the future. That's where it's at. Like you said, building building talent. You know, I think I said this before. You know, you got guys over in your stable that. These people need to see, you know, we we, we want to see another Joe Smith. We want to see another Eric Walker. These are great stories, and that's what make this sport great. Um, indeed, indeed. Let's move on to um, some more news, and I'll go back to you on this one, EJ. Since this is happening in your neck of the woods. Uh, promotional partnership, venture, between uh, Richard Schaefer and, and heavyweight David Hay. Um, uh, they come in to call... Uh, Haymaker Promotions will now be known, henceforth be known as Haymaker Ringstar. Um, most of their business will be done in the UK, but they're also going to venture into the US as well. The question is for me, EJ, um, can um, Haymaker Ringstar uh, make an imprint, make a dent into to, to Matchroom, which is uh, dominating the scene in the UK? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm getting some feedback somewhere. I don't know where. Absolutely, this is um, this is great for boxing. Richard Schaefer, um, the first time I actually saw Richard Schaefer, he was him and I think he came up when when David Hay was supposed to fight. I think it was Monty Barrett, 
and this is the first time I saw them. So them two have been talking for a very long time. The fact that they finally got together is is tremendous. Um, uh, David Hay is actually in Florida at the minute because one of the guys from my gym is actually over there on holiday and he met David Hay. David Hay signing American. They're over there signing American fighters and UK fighters. And also they haven't really. What they're going to do, they're probably going to do a couple of fight deals on certain TV, maybe Channel 5, ITV, and uh, what's the other one? Uh, maybe Box Nation. So they're going to probably sprinkle around their fighters in different avenues. So they're not going to be whole to one contract like Sky. Also, with Sky TV, they're actually going through some really tough times because over in the UK, um, you know, to do with people's wage packets and things, people can't afford Sky Sports, um, Sky itself. It's very expensive um, to have the whole package. You've got like 10 movie channels, uh, five uh, sports channels, and it's just tremendous. It's just too much for most uh, the UK uh, fan base, um, even supporters. They, I know they, they watch football, but obviously you've got BT Sports, so they're competing. And um, to be honest with you, Sky's going through some tough times, but yet the boxing's booming, and that's kept pe keeping people kind of subscribed, especially me. But um, I think, to be honest with you, We'll see how Sky deals with these tough times, but I think it's it's, it's great news, man. Uh, Richard H. Schaefer and David Hay, they can sign, obviously, fighters in America. And if you're an up-and-coming young fighter, you'd want to be signed with them. You know, David Hay, obviously, you know what he's done. He's still active right now. Um, Richard Schaefer, we you know what he's like already. You know, that's a winning combination. I think it's good for both sides of the pond. Um, and they would, if, if anything, yeah, if, if Golden Boy, this is another thing, if Golden Boy don't pull, it, pull up their socks, don't be surprised if they fill that slot, you know, that um they, <laughs> they take over that slot of Golden Boy. So, you know, it's very this song is getting very competitive in that thing. And if you're up and coming fighter, great. You can you can uh, negotiate with David. Like um one of the guys from my gym, he's actually talking to David Hay and trying to see if J David Hay um and uh David he can be signed so he can be on them with Joe. So it will it's great news for boxing and for both sides of the pond. Great news. Um, I'm going to expand the conversation here and, and bring everybody else into it. EJ just basically broke down uh, this promotional uh, partnership uh, and the impact that it could have on um, UK boxing. Uh, I mentioned um, in talking about this that they're going to, uh, Haymaker Ring Star is going to do business in the US as well. Um, the imprint that what Hay and Schaefer are trying to do um, here in, in the US, I think there's a pocket there uh, for them. Um, I know we all know that Schaefer has been trying to make inroads in the U.S. Um, I think with the inclusion of, of Schaefer in this partnership, um, they can make moves here. So uh, response to uh, what EJ was saying vis-a-vis -vis, um, England, but also the potential that that this venture could have uh, when it comes to boxing here in the United States. And anybody can respond. It's an interesting partnership. A very, very interesting partnership because say what you will about Richard Schaefer, what he did with Oscar at Golden Boy, he at least knows the business of boxing well. And it's a it's a really good way for David Hay to learn the ropes of being a pure promoter as well because he knows he's still fighting. I don't think he's going to stay there too long. So I could definitely see them learning and then going to the U.S., and get into the UK, that's a smart move because remember, not a year ago, there was a year or a year and a half ago, I remember there was talk of Matchroom making a US branch and trying to break out into the US here, and that hasn't happened yet. And with this, it helps both ways. It helps Ringstar because David Hay adds credibility to you in the UK. And of course, with Hay, having somebody that knows the business like Schaefer does adds credibility to your endeavor. So it, as a business venture, I see it pretty going very well. Now, as far as television deals and such, that's going to be tough because EJ, like, do you know how long uh, Matchroom has that deal with Sky Sports? Yeah, all up until 2020, I think it is. <laughs> yeah, so got still, long, yeah, they got a long contract. So this, so it's still three years, and let's see, Box Nation has the contract with Warren, I think. So 
there's not much room out there for David Hay to get on UK television, so it's probably smart for him to go link up with Schaefer because then he can probably get showtime. He could at least do like a couple of showbox cars, show off some of his prospects. So as a business mentor, I like it. Um, I, 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 it, it, yeah, it's, it, it, on paper, this is this is a really look good look. Uh, both in the UK here and here stateside as well. I'm going to open up the conversation if anybody else want to respond. I mean, for instance, Bo, and I'll go to you. Uh, my wife, Francis, and Joe uh, was back on here as well. Both of you guys, guys are from Chicago. Um, there's a nice little stable of fighters from that Chicago area, um, up and coming um, stars, all under kind of the same um, banner, if you will. I could see a, a scenario where, for instance, um, Schaefer and Hay. Could make inroads in Chicago and sign the, the best of that talent and kind of cultivate them. Um, that's what I mean by the example of, um, uh, of of having potential here uh, to make moves here in the United States. Yeah, that's a very good point. We they just had the um, last Saturday, I believe. They just had the Windy City. Uh, they had some Windy Day fights up here. I think it's called Windy City fighting on Saturday. So that's a very interesting point. Um, also. Uh, um, Going back to, um, I believe it was, um, I think it was Daniel, Daniel who said it. It adds legitimacy to the, and what it also shows on Schaefer part is, if you don't want to be solely attached to PBC, now you got now you with you with David Hay. So it shows that hey, you're not just solely PBC. You're not just you know everything PBC. So you're willing to branch out and make moves. And to your point, even about them having fights on Showtime, but well, that that is the ultimate goal is to showcase more um, British fighters over in America because there there are a lot of British fighters that you know that people don't don't know anything about. Uh, there are and, fights that, fights that people don't know anything about. So that and, and let's be clear here: there are more world champions from the UK than there is from the US right now. It, 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 that that that's that, that, where at one point it was fourteen. I don't know how many it is now. I think it might be twelve. Or something like that, but it's I mean it's still a high number, and you're at, and you're one hundred percent right. So, uh, and not not just here in Chicago, you have a, a good talent pool of fighters in L.A. You have a good talent pool of fighters in in um, you know um, Texas. You have a good talent pool of fighters just not too far from where I am, up in um, Omaha, Nebraska, where Terrence Crawford comes from. Uh, they go to Missouri for the Golden Gloves. I got a friend who runs a gym, and he's they always posting things. So it's it's from a standpoint. Then think about this: Richard Schaefer just signed a another heavyweight who's a former Olympian. I think he I think he placed medal. He's like his, his name is Tony something, and he, he's a big heavyweight. So he has three former Olympians that's under Schaefer's that under under with the Schaefer banner. So it's a very good move. Um, how it plays out is going to be interesting because the, even though it's a good move, you still got to be able to work together. And that's going to be the key. Can David Hay and Schaefer work together? If they can work together, this can be big. Um, I'll go to you, uh, uh, Gail and Jacob. Your thoughts on all this? It's a smart move. Uh, if David can learn from Schaefer, who's a, a brilliant matchmaker, brilliant deal maker, um, you know, we'll see what happens. But we've seen a lot of partnerships fall apart when the parties can't get along. So that's going to be the key here. Jacob? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think I, you know, reiterate Gail's sentiments is that when you have these partnerships that happen, you know, it, sometimes it's oil and water. Sometimes it goes, you know, well. I mean, you know, we were just talking about Schaefer and being with Oscar and Golden Boy and then they're, they're big falling out. So, you know, Hopefully they won't let pride get the, the best of them. Uh, Schaefer seems like he's a pretty smart guy. He, he is a great matchmaker. And, you know, he was out of the uh, sport for a year. I think it was a year. Um, and now he's back in. Uh, he, I'm, it's, it looks like he's trying to make the right moves to, you know, do what's best uh, for the business. So, um, yeah, we'll see what happens. And I'll go back to you on this one, EJ, to tie a bow on this conversation. The thing I like about, we talk about the potential here in the U.S. You talked about the potential in the U.K. For me, 
the thing I like about this the mo most is that Tay is making moves for his post-boxing life. Um, too many cases, fighters don't do that. Um, they make this money in the ring and just like a lot of athletes, but it's squandered away. I, I, I like the fact that um, Hay, David Hay specifically is like looking at this and like, what can I do three years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, making a forward, making a future uh, for himself after he hangs up the glove. Speak on that, please. Absolutely. That's a good point there, you know. He's in everything, you know. He's actually done um I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. Um, he's on talk shows, he does he's done MMA. Um, you know, he you like you said, he's he's in everything, he's in uh got himself out there. He's almost a celebrity. There's a lot of people over here in the UK, they actually know him through um I'm a celebrity get you out and other talk shows than they know him from actually fighting. So when he actually fought on Dave, um that's a TV terrestrial she the channel over here. He done really good numbers, and Frank Warren and um, and Eddie Hearn, you know, they were saying a lot of things about it. But end of the day, he was promoting it, and he got, I believe, he got like one million on his last fight against basically a nobody. So he carry, he brings a lot of weight with him into the ring, and after the ring, like you said, as a promoter, where he can um, basically just generate money through other fighters, and and with Richard Schaefer, hey, sky's the limit. So like I said. Them two have known each other from back in the days when he was fighting Monty Barrett, when he was actually declared his war against the heavyweight division. Um, him and Richard Schaefer have uh, talked back from then. So they've had a they've had a good relationship, and I'm sure they're always wanting to work each other. So I'm sure they can find out. And with Richard Schaefer, um, David Hay becomes quite powerful. Now, Eddie Hearn has to think, hmm, you know, you know, they wonder what they're going to do now. So if you're an up-and-coming fighter from the Olympics, you might want to sign... We think Nicola Adams has gone with Frank Warren. Annie Joshua has gone with uh, Eddie Hearn. Um, see if they can pull the next talent maybe from America, the next up-and-coming young talent. How, how about Carisha Shields or someone like that? You know, Olympian, proud Olympian, where she can come uh, fighting over in the UK and, and, and obviously go back in America. So sky's the limit. I think they'll be pur purchasing or, or poaching, as we say over here, all your UK, all your U USA talent. And uh, yeah, man, I think David Hay has definitely set himself up for after post-boxing. Um, indeed. Let's move on. And, and like I said, uh, there was no boxing recap because there was no real significant fights of note. Um, so we're going straight into the news and then we're previewing um, boxing is coming up this weekend. Let's do that now. Um, big fight, of course, uh, this weekend, the rematch between Carl Frampton and Leo Santa Cruz. Uh, they fought last year in one of the fights of the year for 2016. Frampton ended up winning by... Um, decision. Um, they're having a rematch this weekend um, in Vegas, I believe, on Showtime. Um, I'll go to you on this one, Daniel. A lot of back and forth discussion about this fight. Uh, can Frampton um, sum up uh, uh, sum up the skills uh, to d have essentially a repeat against uh, Santa Cruz, which a lot of folks, uh, to be honest, feel Santa Cruz won that fight. Can the rematch live up to the original contest? Your thoughts? It can and it should, because luckily these these fighters are already acclimated to each other. In fact, Carl Frampton seems to be eager for it. Like he did an interview with Showtime, and he said, "Everybody needs a dance partner." It looks like Santa Cruz is mine, and that's pretty striking, considering that a lot of people thought that his dance partner would would be quick. But I could definitely see this fight going into it because. I I give Santa Cruz this. He he did not go to training camp all the way with his dad, and we know how much his dad means to him. So his head may not be complete have been completely in the right place. This time around, his dad has been there for training camp. He may start to do a lot what what he tried to do in the later rounds, earlier, trying to negate Frampton's lateral movement. But Frampton's going to learn, too. Frampton's going to see that the, that second half of the fight, that was, that's what made it pretty close. So he, he has to study that to make sure that he's not he doesn't get Santa Cruz's motor running again. Because if he does, that, that may be a bad, that may be a, 
an easy way for Santa Cruz to get the victory in. Now, location's gonna probably gonna matter in this sense. This is it is Las Vegas, a lot closer to LA, Santa Cruz's fan base, so a lot closer to Mexican Americans. But we know for a fact that Frampton's fan base travels and they travel big. So even location, you might still have a majority crowd that's pro Frampton. Especially now with today, apparently all the lower level seats have been reduced from, I think, 500, I think it was $200 to $50 as far as ticket sales. So you know they're trying to sell the tickets now. So it's, it's going to be an interesting fight. Both fighters look to be well ready to get into it. And personally, I think we're probably going to see a better Santa Cruz, but there's a very good chance we might see a, a better Frampton as well. Um, I'll go to you on this one, EJ. Uh, the word um, over in the UK, uh, wh wh what's their thinking about this fight? Because uh, I know I believe, you, I, I believe you thought Santa Cruz won the first fight. So the word from the UK regarding this rematch, the level of an, an excitement and anticipation. Well, Sky Sports have um, bought the fight, so they'll be airing it, and they're doing 24, uh, you know, media coverage on it, uh, the build-up, the whole thing. And, um, yeah, man, I think it's, 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 it's doing pretty well. A lot of the UK people believed, and uh, I believed, I don't know you in America, that um, Carl Frank was the fire of the year. I don't know if that's official, but, you know, so, you know, he's, Big coverage over in Ireland. He's obviously got um, a fan base, obviously in New York or whatever, and um, they're they're over there to support him. But um, yeah, it's doing really good numbers in terms of um, you know, the the support and uh, everyone's looking forward to this fight, man. I mean, I believe Santa Cruz will do better. I mean, do better. I mean, I believe that you know when I watched the fight that he kind of nipped it. But hey, I'm not going to argue back the other way. But um, you know, Santa Cruz should come back, but he's doing really good numbers. And don't be surprised if he actually surpasses the first fight in, in terms of the, the performance and the numbers, uh, the, the attendance numbers that viewers are watching over in the UK. Um, I'll go to you on this one, Bo. We talked about this bout. We talked about this fight a couple of weeks ago on Baylor, on um, Ingram's uh, Baylor uh, uh, box, Worldwide Boxing. And, and the question was, and I'll, I'll repeat the question um, here to you Was this a case of Frampton? fighting at his absolute best so he may not be able to surpass the level that he showed in the first fight um can santa cruz make the necessary adjustments where he can get um a decision this time hmm. you know there was a time i would have answered that question differently but given a lot of things that's been taking place um i personally believe that that Carl Frampton we saw could have possibly been the best Carl Frampton we saw because he was doing things we never seen him do. But then again, such as boxing, where he was probably forced to do those things that he would do because of the type of fighter Leo Santa Cruz is. And up here, and him fighting at 126, he probably felt naturally stronger, naturally better. He didn't uh, uh, fighting at a weight that he felt more comfortable at. But I still feel that that was probably um, the best Carl Frampton we saw. Now, from a mental standpoint, Leo Santa Cruz can do better from a mental standpoint because his father is back and in his corner, and that seemed to really bother him. But from a fight standpoint, and I, I talked about this with Daniel and on his show, and my biggest thing with Leo Santa Cruz is why I still feel that you will have the same outcome was he made absolutely positively no adjustments at all during this fight. So I question his ring IQ. You know, you can work on speed, you can work on movement and even punch angles and countering, but you can't work on your intelligence. And he didn't display any ring IQ. He fights one way, he has one motor. Now with his father back, maybe he'll be a little bit different, but I, I just haven't seen anything to make me feel that way. But I will say this, I don't. I hope Carl Frampton don't go into this fight thinking, I'll just do what I did in the first fight and don't prepare to possibly see a different Leo Santa Cruz because just because we haven't seen it doesn't mean it's not there because we didn't right. see a different Carl Frampton. Uh, you know, the Frampton we saw against Santa Cruz wasn't the one we saw against Quig. So just because you don't see it, it don't mean it's not there. So don't prepare 
for that and don't have a backup plan. He better come at his absolute best ready for everything because I have a feeling Leo Santa Cruz felt like his pride was hurt a little bit. And so he's going to come out and he's going to try to prove something. If the Leo Santa Cruz that fought Abner Mare shows up, and, and, and I think Daniel said this or um, Francis them said this, if the Leo Santa Cruz that fought Abner Mare shows up, it could be a long night for Carl Frampton. Exactly. Um, I, I will go to you on this one, uh, Jacob and Gail. Um, your breakdown of the fight, number one. Secondly, did Carl Frampton make a mistake by having this fight out in um, Vegas as opposed to him fighting, uh, have, trying to seek a rematch back at Barclays or even bringing Santa Cruz over to uh, 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 Belfast? I've got three thoughts on that to answer to your question. Yes, yes, and yes. I think he, if he's got anything to worry about, it's home cooking. Uh, Leo Santa Cruz is going to have the benefit of the doubt throughout the fight. Um, in Nevada, your judges all must come from Nevada. So we've got three Nevada judges uh, who are used to seeing a lot of Mexican fighters and scoring a lot of Mexican fighters. Kenny Bayless is the referee, and I, to me, I think the only major difference in this fight is going to be home cooking, and in a close, close fight, that can be a problem. Carl's supporters will be there, and that helps, and it certainly doesn't hurt. Um, the last fight I recall being in Las Vegas for a British fighter versus a, a local, if you will, was... Um, uh, Badu Jack and George Groves, and the Groves fans were crazy, crazy volume. And and there were there wasn't a huge number of them, but boy, did they make their presence known. So the Frampton fans will do the same. And judges are human beings; they hear it. But of course, the house house fans will be there for Leo. So uh, I agree with Bo. I I don't think Leo adjusts well. And I also don't think the version of Leo Santa Cruz that we saw against Abner Mara shows up unless there's Abner Mara's on the other side of the ring. And Abner isn't there. Carl is. Carl does have an ability to, do, to adjust, and he's the smarter fighter. But in a close fight, home cooking has happened many times, as we know, in Las Vegas, and that's my concern. I think Frampton will win but it may not be reflected on the scorecard. And it's going to be, I think it'll be even closer than it was the first time. Your even, thoughts. Whatever way it goes, I think the scorecards will be very close. Your thoughts, Jacob? Um, to answer your, I think one of your questions, I, I think Fran, what Frampton wants to do or what he wants to accomplish in his career is he, he wants to be known within the United States. So I, I don't think it was necessarily a bad move to, um, to take this uh, fight in Vegas. Um, Vegas is, you know, kind of the boxing capital of the U.S. Uh, a lot of the big fights are there. Um, I know, you know, New York's probably right behind it and then L.A. But, um, you know, he's, a, he's an extremely confident guy. He, he really believes in himself. He has a team that believes in himself, and he's been able to accomplish a lot. So, you know, sometimes when you have fighters like that, they, it doesn't really matter where they fight because they're in that zone and um, they believe in themselves so much that it's it doesn't matter. Um, will we see some home cooking? Uh, I'm not sure. I, you know, judges are all over the place. Like, we, we talk about it, I think, every time that there's a, a, um, a possibility of it. And, you know, I get surprised sometimes where – you know, for example, like at the Gell uh, versus Durrell, and and you know, people were worrying about that too. But you know, ended up going to to the uh, foreign fighter. Um, but you know, that that's a problem that has to be fixed uh, in the future. And there's a lot of things that probably can be suggested to fix that. Who do I think is going to win the fight? I actually think I think Leo Santa Cruz is is going to win the fight. Um, I think he will make adjustments. Uh, I think he might have taken for granted, like I think many people did, 
um, that he was going to be the bigger guy and be able to um, just kind of walk through Frampton like he does his other opponents. And he was – he probably just, you know, uh, how, what is the word? Uh, he was overconfident. And I, I don't think he's going to make that mistake again. Um, I think that if he comes out fast, faster than he did in the uh, first fight, that he has a chance to um, – to potentially hurt Carl Frampton and uh, maybe even, you know, um, you know, pour it on. Um, we know that he can go all 12 and he's going to pour it on late. So if he can get that fast start, he might not need any uh, judges uh, home cooking, but uh, Frampton's a fantastic fighter. Uh, I give him all the credit in the world. I mean, he, he's accomplished so much and that's why he was fighter of the year for most people. Um, but uh, I'm just glad that they're fighting. It, it, it should be a terrific fight. Um, if you would have asked me this two weeks ago, um, I would have went with Frampton, but something tells me that um, Santa Cruz is going to get the decision. Um, I think he will try to adopt uh, a style that he fought against Abner Mars. And the more I think about it, I'm not sure if Frampton can fight at a higher level than he did uh, during that first fight. So I think it's going to be a situation where Santa Cruz is going to get a decision in another tough competitive exciting fight and it'll probably be which will probably set up a third fight um that's just my opinion i see scorsese has joined us uh we're talking leo santa cruz carl frampton the rematch your thoughts on it sir um when we talk about who got the least adjustments to make most of the time we look at it's a feedback on it is that me it may be me me, me. let me go go ahead it may be on my end all right um yeah there you go okay um when we talk about who got the adjustments to making rematches, we look at the second half of the fight for the most part and say who, who adjusts in the second half. And I think a lot of people are, um, so. like I said before, Leo's getting this typecast as just a Mexican-style brawler. I don't see that. He impressed me in this fight. He impressed me in the fight before. I When I heard 117 in the first fight, I said, okay, maybe one point wide, but that's definitely um, credible for Leo Santa Cruz. Um, when you look at the end of the at end of the first fight, I really don't feel like there's rounds going to Carl Frampton. The first fight in the first half, I felt like some of those rounds that um Steve Farhood was scoring, I I couldn't believe I disagree with him so heavily because we always we always right there. I feel like Carl Frampton basically had a left hook in this fight. He did not have a better jab. He did not have a better body work. His right hand a lot of the time could not get there because it's weird to say it because Leo Santa Cruz is a technician. You look at the left jab and you look where his chin is. It's, it's dang near by his nipples. It's, it's just right by his nipples. Uh, you look when he throws the you look when he throws a left hook. His right guard is right there by his face. Now you look at Frampton's. Look when he got knocked down in the first in the fight versus Gonzalez. His hand is continuously dropping. That's why he's getting knocked down in this fight. That's at least one of the times. And Leo Santa Cruz was taking advantage of that too. And I'm saying, hey, you you counting all these big power shots by Frampton, but he's always having to punch through the guard. He's always having to punch through a tight. When you throw the right hand, you won't hit the chin. He's throwing it and landing off the top of the head because Leo Santa Cruz chin is tucked, is down, is deep. And I'm saying, yeah, he did he land that? I don't know. Did that graze off him? I don't know. But when I look at the cleaner punches, punches where a guy don't have a guard up, his head's going, those punches belong to Leo Santa Cruz. The Carl Frampton continuously pulling back with his hands down. I, but, I, but I'm going with Frampton again because it's, it's, it's unanimous that everybody is going to score the style, just like with James DeGale. They're going to score what's flashy. And I like flash too, but if you're gonna be flashy, you gotta, you know, you gotta hit and don't be hit. You gotta um have more than a left hook to me. Jab his body, right hand his body. I didn't see none of that from Carl Frampton. I saw a left hook, I saw a guy playing catch up. That's why he couldn't fight the the style of fight he fought versus Quig. Why do you think the pace was so slow? Because he had to play catch up with a guy that wasn't gonna let him quig himself through the decision. So I I mean. I've been adamant about this fight ever since the last days. I probably watched it 40 times the first one, probably more. And I, I I still can't believe the decision. Every time I watch it, I I do, like I said, he had a good left hook. The left hook was his best. And I, and I hesitate to even call it good because, like I said, that right hand of Leo Santa Cruz, it don't lead a chin. He don't make mistakes. He's not flashy, but the dude, 
he well taught, man. Like he is in a shell. People say, yo, he gets too low, he gives up his height. Cause he's tucking his chin, cause he's changing levels, because he's good enough to do it. And that's what I see. So I, I mean, I just feel like he's gonna get typecast again. I feel like I'm gonna be here saying the same thing that he won the fight. And if he wins this fight, and it looks like the last fight, people need to understand he won it because it looked like the last fight, which he actually won. But that's just my take on it. Okay, uh, let's let's talk about the undercard. But I'll go to you on this one, Daniel, and then you can follow up, Gail, and everybody can um, chime in as well. Um, Dejan Zlatikanin, uh, Mikey Garcia. I'm gonna keep saying I, I've been saying this ever since this fight was announced. Um, I think this is a low key, a, a very good fight. Um, Garcia is the favorite. Um, I'm predicting him to win, but I would not be surprised if Zalata Kani won this fight. Um, I think he's going to give Mikey Garcia hell in there. Um, second fight back from a two year plus layoff, and you get into this a guy gets this tough nut. Uh, Garcia's talented enough to do it, he's skilled enough to do it. He has the power, of course, but again, Zalata Kani. This is not a guy you just roll over. First you, Daniel, then you, Gail. I don't think Daniel's right there. His, his mic is muted, so I'll go to you on this one, Gail. This is a fight uh, that uh, both guys, it's a, it's a career turning point fight for both of them. And they want to look good as well as win. They got a lot of knockouts between them, but I do think because they have not been that active, it it is likely to go the distance. But we're going to see a lot of action. I I really think there's a large possibility that this co-main event could steal the show, even from Frampton Santa Cruz. I think it'll be that action packed. Um, this is really going to prove whether Mikey Garcia has got the goods that we all thought he had before he sort of did a disappearing act on us a couple of years ago. Zlata Kanin is, is an interesting guy. He's a very short, blocky guy. He's short for this division. He's, he's almost, if you drew him, you'd draw a square. I mean, his body shape from his head, shoulders down, I mean, he's, a, he's this walking, you know, block. And, you know, makes, makes him a tough target. It also makes him very steady. So Garcia is going to have to really work on him hard because he's he's a tough he's a tough guy, um, and we'll see we'll see if you know after you know a long long layoff, uh, Garcia's back. But you know remember back when Garcia was at his prime on the rise, everyone was excited about him. You know he's clearly the most talented out of that whole gene pool in the family. And, you know, then he, then he was gone. So this is his opportunity. He's, he's looked good so far. We'll find out. We really are going to find out. This is going to be a good test for him. I'll go to you on this one, Bo, and then EJ. Your thoughts on this fight? Um, I like this fight. Listen, uh, the only reason why this fight interested me more than anything is because Mikey Garcia did not look that great in his last fight against Rojas. And he kept getting hit on Mikey Garcia, like with that right hand. And I'm just like, that's not Mikey Garcia. Like, that's not the guy that I remember who was being talked about on the top five pound for pound list. You know, and, 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 and people forget that Mikey Garcia was being put on the pound for pound list. And this is back even when Floyd was active. So um, the thing that, that Mikey has working for him, Mikey has a three inch height advantage and a three inch reach advantage. Mikey is probably one of the most technically sound fighters to ever come out of that Knox boxing gym. Uh, Experience-wise, ring IQ, even corner experience ring IQ, all advantage to Mikey. But this guy he's fighting is not a pushover. Um, he's not well known because, you know, he fought most of the time overseas. Um, he had a few fights here in America, but they weren't big fights. The only thing that concerns me about, um, I'm, I'm just going to call him Dejan. I can't pronounce the last name. I'm not going to butcher it. Is He's short and he's stocky, so he's, 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 he's a little bit more muscular than I would like him to have because the thing about muscles is um, as fight goes on, and unless he's in tremendous shape, and he probably is, but at, at that level against a guy like Mikey Garcia, we'll see. But as fight goes on and, you know, muscles 
tend to start to feel a little heavy on you, which means your arms will start to get a little more warrior. Your punches will, will lose a little bit more snap on them. They won't be as crisp and sharp. Um, but Mikey Garcia, he has the goods to win. The only thing that I'll, I'll disagree a little bit with Gail about is I believe we all knew Mikey Garcia had the goods, but we got robbed of being able to see it because, like you said, he went away for two years. But it's an interesting fight. I think Mikey Garcia should win it, but I don't think nobody should count his opponent out at all. Um, EJ and then um, Scorsese. I don't know too much about it, man. All right, let me turn the TV down one second. I don't know too much about like um, the opponent. I know Mikey talked to him a couple of times. Um, you know, he's been waiting for this long time since um, trying to get out of the Bob Aaron situation and the contract. And he's looking forward to this, man. So I hope he does well. And um, yeah, man, it should be a good fight. But like I said, I don't know too much about the opponent. Um, I should have done my research beforehand. My bad. No problem. No problem. Uh, I'm Scorsese and then uh, Jacob and finally Daniel, if we can get him back. Scorsese, your thoughts on yeah. the... Um, yeah. Yeah, short, short um, southpaw fighter versus a taller, orthodox fighter. This is not Ricky Burns type of hype. This is like, Ricky Burns damn near looks six foot sometimes when he's in the ring. And, uh, you know, I think that was like a five or six inch height disadvantage for Dejan. And that's probably his most struggle fight that I've seen out of him. You much rather be three inches shorter than an opponent if you're going to fight like Dejan, not five or six. And he, he's in a better you know, in a better groove to be able because what he does is he really don't cut the distance. He he marches, he sees you throw, and he loads up on that left hand. He loads up. He loads up on a shot and and that I, I like him. I like him in a, a fight at one thirty five with Shafikov, but I think style's gonna make fights and Mikey Garcia, his last fight, you're not gonna see that style. You're not gonna see what he did versus Rojas walking him down and dominating him and throwing right hands, walking through but no, he's not going that route. You're going to see the skate around the ring, the the check left hook, the placement of shots, the uppercut. That that straight up styles make fights today. And um, what he's going to have to do is make sure he just don't lift that head up, Carl Frampton-esque, and just catch one of those left hands. And I think he'll be all right. Um, I like Dejan, so I've been talking a lot of crap, but styles do make fights. If he touches the chin, that'll be – he got a puncher's chance. He cannot – yeah, he's not gonna cut distance and get low and come in and work the body. He's 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 way different than that. Matter of fact, his body's more open than he opens up the opponent's body from judging from the Ricky Burns fight. So I think Mikey Garcia got an easier fight than people think, but it definitely got a puncher's chance and a chance is as much hard as he got to get in there with those bigger fighters and you know duke it out. But I got Mikey Garcia big. Yeah. Um, Jacob, and then uh, finally Daniel. Yeah, I mean, this is a nice little undercard fight. Uh, I think it's going to be um, very competitive, and I really think it's going to come down to um, whoever really make, makes the first mistake and if the other fighter capitalizes on it. I could see either guy winning. Um, you know, Mikey Garcia, my only, I guess, uh, criticism of him is I don't know – I mean, it seems like he's back and he wants to do this, but I'm not sure that he's 100% um, committed to, you know, doing this long term. Um, he's spoken about it uh, before. And so sometimes that can kind of, you know, uh, take you out of it. Um, but I hope we see a very good and competitive fight. But I, I really think it's just going to be a matter of time before – you know, one of them catches the other one because, uh, you know, um, they're just not careful enough or, um, you know, leave themselves open. Um, if I had to call a winner, I, I'm i going to go uh, DZ by uh, upset. Mm, mm. Um, interesting. Uh, Daniel, if you're back, um, Zlata Kanin and Garcia, your thoughts? First, I got to commend Mikey Garcia. I got to commend him for – doing this type of fight just in your second fight in your comeback. Because Sadiq Janine is, yeah, we all pretty much made the joke that he's a square, but he's pretty much a natural lightweight. So hes it's not a guy that's draining himself to get there. He's a natural lightweight. He's sure, Yeah, he's short, he's stocky, and he can land a punch. 
The issue, though, is when you're facing somebody like Mikey Garcia who has the ring, a- ring acumen to take away that punch from you with patience and with position punching, position countering. The main thing for Garcia, though, it's I think the main question, how much is he back? Is he completely 100% back into this? Or can he get sh- can he get clipped by Sadiq Chenin with a left hook and be dropped? There's hope, but then there's also a chance that uh, we Sadiq Chenin hasn't exactly been tested. Like the guy he won the title from was it was a pretty much a late replacement. He was a cop beforehand, interestingly enough. So now you, it's a big step for both guys, and both guys have motivation. Like Sadiq Chenin wants to prove that you didn't pick me just because you're just because I'm a pushover. And Mikey wants to prove that he's still in the discussion for pound for pound. And he's still, as I said, in the weight range where should a Lomachenko come up, he's right there. Yeah. So it's an interesting test. I'm gonna say Garcia's probably gonna win. Most likely split decision though. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, let's move on. Um, EJ, you didn't know much about didn't know much about Zlatan uh, but you surely know a lot about this next fight. At least Selby, he's fighting uh, Jonathan Victor uh, Barrios, I believe, on the undercard of this uh, on the same card with Frampton Garcia as well as Design uh, Mikey Garcia. About uh, I, I I see Selby. I'm like, man, I wasn't impressed by his fight with Parker. Uh, this fight with Barrios, is it a just a move along fight for him? You think Barrios uh, will give uh, uh, Selby a much tougher contest than meeting people expect? Uh, your thoughts on this fight and your thoughts on 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 Lee Selby specifically? Hey man, you got me again, man. Like I should do my research, and I usually do. I don't know too much about the opponent. I didn't even know he was fighting, but I know so. No, you, 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 you come on my show, man. Nah, man. I, you know, I was concentrating on the main event fights, right? I was concentrating on um, the Francis Vargas fight and the other one. The that, That's the one. I, I know about that, them two fighters. But what it is, is this, yeah? Um, Lee Selby got a good beating by Eric Hunter. I said Parker. I mean Eric Hunter. My apologies. That's all right. That's all right. Eric Hunter, I got you on that one at least. But what I'm saying <laughs> is that... <laughs> hey, Eric Hunter gave a good old beating. I was covering the whole thing. That was a... Um, Joshua Martin uh, main event and they were undercard and uh, I thought Eric Hunter got robbed well kind of got dealt with by the referee unfortunately but that's what happens if you fight overseas and uh, you're not in your backyard but anyway Leo sabi has been out for a while for whatever reason um, and he's back in the USA obviously he's Al Heyman Al Heyman backed uh, Al, Al Heyman a fighter so I expect this to be a you know, good comeback and he should do his thing so again I don't know too much of the opponent, and maybe after the fight we'll know much more. But um, as as it as stands now, I think it should be it should be a good fight for himself. And I'll just open up the conversation for anybody else who wants to chime in on this fight. If so, please do. I think Selby's gonna handle this guy pretty easily. Um, he's a Argentinian. He looks like he's fought mostly in Argentina. Um, his opponents, you know, don't have. Uh, you know, great records and whatnot. Uh, his losses were against you know Garcia, Mikey Garcia, ironically. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think Selby. He's been getting you know. Although I think he, he's one of the weaker guys in, in that that division. Um, I think he's still a step up, above above uh, some of that uh, middle class, uh, which is what Barros uh, seems to be. Um, so I, I think he'll he'll do his thing. Um, all the criticism, I think it's it's getting into his head, and potentially if Frampton wins uh, the main event and Selby wins his, you know that could be his big uh, unification payday uh, fight um, back in the uh, uh, UK. Um, comments yeah. from, from anyone? Else? Oh, I'm sorry, Gail. Yeah, I think absolutely. Uh, Selby, you know, he'll be a little tasty appetizer for the British fans there waiting to see Frampton, and. Um, do fine 
Uh, I have not been too impressed with the level of these unknown Argentinian opponents that seem to turn up on our doorstep all the time when somebody needs a fight. And then, you know, Selby gets served up for a nice, easy payday uh, back in Great Britain. You know, after these, what, what will be two very difficult fights, win or lose, uh, you know, it's time for Frampton to hit cruise control a little bit. And Selby won't say no to a big check. So what the hell? <laughs> I think that's where that's all going. Um, any comments, Bo, or you just want to move on to talk about other fights? Uh, I'm going to... I'm going to do something that I really haven't done here, and I'm going to do it based off what I saw. I'm going to pick Barrios to pull an upset here, and I'm going to tell you why. Oh, yeah, detail, I, I am, bro, detail. I'm going to tell you why. He has four losses, but he's only been knocked out once, and that was by Mikey Garcia, and this is when Mikey Garcia was fighting at that world-class level. So he's tasted that. I don't like the way Shelby looked against Eric Hunter. Shelby goes back on his back foot with his head straight up, and that's how Eric Hunter was able to get him down and knock him down. Barrios is a high volume type of guy. He comes at him. He, he has, you know, he's he's typical um, one of those guys. He's just high volume. He comes at you. He uses the angles. He has decent footworks. The level of competition is not going to be as the same as uh, Shelby because, like I said, he lost to Mikey Garcia. But I think Barrios has, based off what I saw against Hunter, Barrios has what it takes to upset Lee Shelby at the very least, make him uncomfortable enough to where it looks like he is somewhat doing some damage to Lee Shelby. So I'm going to pick the underdog in this one. I, I normally don't do that, but I'm, I'm going to pick the underdog. I figured if Jacobs can do it, then you know what? I'll do it too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's not forget that there was the, the cab driver that beat um, Argentinian cab driver that beat uh, the ghost. So he might be That's onto something. Right. That's right. Yep. Yep. I'm, I'm joining there, Mike. I'm going to say upset because – Lee Selby has not impressed me at all. Like I said, I've always said he's been the weakest, the weakest link among the champions of featherweight. But I see what he did here. He's trying to get into the talk because right now the talk is Santa Cruz, Frampton, and Oscar Valdez. And there's already been a scuttlebutt. Well, not scuttlebutt. There's already been discussions under the radar should Frampton win. They're going to try to set up a unification with Selby uh, this summer. But that could be the real very easily, because one thing that one thing people forget about Argentinians, they're tough as hell. So it's not gonna it's not gonna be like a showcase fight where Lee Selby's gonna get like a dramatic knockout to me. If he's gonna win, Lee Selby's probably gonna win because he grinded it out. But that Eric Hunter fight, when you look that bad. And the only thing that probably saved you, well, two things saved you, the fact that Eric Hunter didn't step on the gas and a little bit of UK home cooking. When that's the only thing that saved your title, that's not going to help you when you just announced like two or three weeks ago that you were fighting. Oh, and you're in a place that probably not a lot of people know you in Las Vegas. So naturally, the crowd that probably is going to show up there for Santa Cruz Big Latino Mexican American crowd. They may like do what they what they temporarily did with my Donna fought Floyd, adopt them for a bit, because hey, he speaks Spanish, he's Latino, we'll cheer him. What about the Frampton crowd that that he's gonna bring though? That's that's the thing. Is it an Irish crowd or an English crowd? Well, well, same deal. You know, they'll adopt him, and the Mexicans will adopt Barrios, and everybody's happy. And and I'll I'll attest to this though uh, what uh, Gail says is that those uh over the pond crowds are the they they are, they're as loud as hell man those guys are loud oh yeah and, you know and it, they make noise for you know three others for every one person whose butt's actually in the seat the numbers right. are often not that big you know on a, just a sheer scale they might be in one section or two but. Damn, they carry on. It's fun. It's great. Yeah. And, Eric, and Eric Hunter, you know, I think he's a good fighter. So, I mean, Selby, you know, arguably lost that fight. But, I mean, it was to, a, 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 to I think, a better fighter than uh, Barros. But I respect that, you know, potential upset, though, too. Um, I want to go to you, Scorsese, to talk about this next fight. 
Uh, we talked about the Showtime card. We're going to talk about the HBO card right now. Um, started with Francisco Vargas, who fought arguably the, the fight of the year, both in 2015 and in 2016. 2015 against Mira, 2016 against Alito. Um, he's returning to the ring fighting um, Birchilch. Um, excuse me if I'm butchering his name. Um, your thoughts on this fight, Scorsese? Um, yeah, I watched Birchilch because Analta suggested him and said he would um... – He's a big puncher at 130. I, I can agree that the power's likely big. Looks heavy-handed. But the man looks like he's – it's not muscle memory in the ring to me. It looks like when he throws the punch, he has to remind himself, bring it back, bring it back. Like, you know, okay, move your head. It, it Vargas is so much more fluid than him. He gets – Vargas does have that tendency to make everything hard. And that's, that could be his downfall here. But besides that, he should be doing what he tried to do late with Salido, moving with the jab, throwing power shots on the movement, hopefully keeping, you know, hopefully ain't feeling too old to where he can't do this throughout the fight. And this guy can catch up with him and draw him into a fight because he don't need a hard fight right here. He needs to get this guy out of here and show that he's a champion because I don't think that uh, Bracha, I don't see world level. He might got big power, but I, Vargas is – in his own right, he's world level. He need to show that and box this man and stay away from the brawling and banging. Because this guy, he looks tough, but the skills, I ain't going to say they there. Um, I'll go to you on this one, EJ. Uh, Vargas and Uh Scorsese was mentioning that a lot of times Vargas makes the fights harder than it needs to be. I agree with that. The question to you is, can Vargas fight a disciplined fight instead of falling in love and being seduced by the crowd, uh, getting into firefights and getting into extra tough battles that he really doesn't need to be, need to be getting into because he has the skill set to outbox guys, but a lot of times he just doesn't. It just eschews defense just for uh, fanfare excitement. No, there's the answer to that. No, he, and that's why we like him. He's going to go in there, he'll have a game plan, but you know he ain't going to stick to it. He's going to start throwing down. And, um, you know, and that's that's why we like him. I mean, if he was that type of fighter to stick to the game plan, I think it would be a different type of fighter. But, no, nah, I think he's still going to throw it down. I think he's going to, you know, he'll put his heart on his sleeve and, and try to win it accordingly in that way. Um, if he doesn't and does, like, you know, does that, I'll be surprised. You know, that'll be that. That will show some good skill. I remember Marco Antonio Barrera later in his career, he tried to do that as well. And, um, you know, uh, it, it would be good for him, you know, give him a couple of miles. He wouldn't have that much miles on the clock, but um, I, I'm expecting a war here, man. And um, this should be a great fight, man. I'm 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 talking fight of the night. I, I'm going with that one, fight of the night, right there. Um, I ain't really got a winner yet, but in fact, I haven't really picked the winner. But I think that should be fight of the night, man. I'm expecting a really good fight. I'll go to you on this one, Gail, since you will be live at the fight covering it for Communities Digital News. Um, the pre-fight build-up for this, uh, what has it been like uh, leading up to it? You know, this is a fairly simple fight on both sides. This is not a fight of great complexity. This is going to be La Guerra. That's it. These guys like to bang. They like to put on a show. They can bring it. They love it. They, they hit and they get hit, and they like both. The problem, just as um, we've said here very well, is you know Vargas really doesn't need to do that and really shouldn't do that but he just can't help himself. He just, he just loves it. And he loves the fact he's been in two fights of the year. He says, I'm going for a third. To him, that's really the prize. Yeah, he has a belt, but I don't think he honestly care as much if somebody said he's in the fight of the year for the third straight year. <laughs> and the crowd loves him for it. They follow him, you know, his fans are, are very attached to him, and he's a very personable guy. He interacts, he loves it. Uh, the last card at Fantasy Springs, he was there doing meet and greets. And, you know, you see a lot of fighters do that stuff, and they go through the motions, and they do it because the promoter made him do it, and they kind of, you know, they're barely polite. He loves it. Vargas is the guy, looking at my little icon picture here, who do my surprise when he was doing the press for his fight with Salido, he's chatting with me and hands his belt to me. <laughs> I'm thinking, buddy, what are you doing? He just thought, you know, check it out. It's cool. You know, he's just one of those guys. So he will bring it and 
The other, the other little ingredient about this, which I'm sure we're going to talk about next, is the fact that the co-main event uh, features Takashi Mura, who he fought on the undercard of the Cotto versus Canelo fight at the end of 2015, which was the surprise fight of the year. And he's gunning for a rematch with Mura. Of course, Golden Boy would absolutely love it. HBO would love it to put those guys together again. So they're, of course, hoping to see Vargas win. They're hoping to see Mura win and put these guys back together. And, and Vargas knows Mura is going to be watching, so that's a little extra incentive for him. And, yep, the crowd's going to go nuts, and you know they're there for one thing and one thing only, and we all know it. So it's no art. It's just action. But I think as long as Vargas can avoid being cut, which at this stage of his career is a problem for him. He needs to avoid having the fight stopped on cuts. Although on the other hand, he start, if he starts off strong um, and it gets stopped, he might still be okay. But he's watched that. That, that to me is his biggest problem. Um, but, uh, but lucky for him that he's not featuring his or facing his opponent at his opponent's prime. Um, Birchall is a little bit past his cell date, and that's good. Um, I will go to you, uh, Bo and, and, and Daniel, um, Jacob as well. I will pose the same question to you guys that I posed to EJ. Um, essentially, can is Vargas disciplined enough to, to be in a fight where it doesn't end up in an outright brawl? particularly at this stage of his career, given the attention and the spotlight and the shine he got uh, following the Mira fight, following the, the Orlando Salido fight. Um, is, it a point, is it at a point right now where he's like 2017 Arturo Gatti, for instance? Uh, yes and no. Uh, I'll actually, and it's funny you said Arturo Gatti because I was saying he kind of reminds me of a Salvador San, uh, Sanchez type of fighter, which is we know he has the ability to box, but once he gets that hit, he just decides to go to war. And 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 uh, you're right, Arturo Gatti was the same way. Yeah, I would say Sanchez was far more disciplined, even in his yeah. fight with uh, with uh, uh, Gomez. Exactly. And even Zuma Nelson, he he yeah, they brought the fight to him, but he still fought in a disciplined uh, way. Even exactly. those, though, even that those were exciting fights as opposed to Mira. He got hit a few times, and he was just like, "Fuck it, let's go." Right, and and that that's why when you brought up Gotti, I, I was like, "Yeah, that's probably a better analogy thing." Because I was definitely thinking Salvador Sanchez. Uh, the thing with um, the thing with Vargas, he is disciplined. He really is disciplined to do it. But the problem is, and Gail hit it. He's one of those guys who he likes when the fans are jumping like. He's one of those guys that if you watch him sparring, he's probably the most disciplined dude that you see sparring. But when he's in a fight and his blood get to bowling and the fans are screaming and jumping up and down and, you know, he, you know, he feels that energy, then he's just like, okay, bring that ass. Let's get it popping. That's the thing about Vargas. He's just one of those guys that he wants everything to be appealing and appeasing to the fans, even if it means him losing his title. He just wanted to be appealing and appeasing to the fans. And he has a motor to just won't quit. He has unbelievable courage and ability to take punishment. I, I, I am also concerned about the cuts because here's the reality. The guy that he's fighting, Miguel, has an 87% knockout ratio. Now, somebody said earlier is muscle memory, but also some, some of the things that Miguel do is kind of robotic. But you don't forget how to punch. And you don't forget how to punch and punch hard. That stays with you regardless of how old you are. George Foreman knocked out Michael Moore because you don't forget how to punch. The, the last thing to go on a fighter is his punching power. Now, one can say, hey, well, it was against the type of level of opposition it, it went to, which is, which is true. But when you knock out 87% of your opponents, I don't care what level of competition is, that still has to be taken into consideration. So if, if, he, gets, if he gets cut, and I'm talking about Vargas, that could vitalize Miguel. That could give Miguel some, some, you know, some get up and go. That, that could help him get his second win. If he's, oh, I got this guy cut. I got a chance to win. So I think if Vargas comes out and fights smart, he has a much better chance 
he has the experience, he has the, uh, you know, he has the know-how, and he, he just has more tools. But the question is, will he use those tools or will he keep them in the chest? And if he keeps them in the chest and tries to go, you know, you know, mono a mono balls to walls with a guy like this, it could it it, it could it could not be his best day because remember we just we saw Mora put him down. All right. And this guy that he's fight has the ability to not just put him down, but make him stay down. So it's it's a tough call. I'm gonna go with Vargas. I just think Vargas is also one of those guys, he knows if there's a lot on the line. So he's gonna have that little extra oomph in the tank. And Gail is right that um about um Miguel, he's you know, he's 25, but he's a tested 25. So it's going to be interesting to see how he responds to a, a guy at that level, a Vargas level, coming down on him and putting it on his ass. Hey, hey, I don't, I don't know if he likes these wars, though. I, I to be honest, I don't. Cause when he got like the eighth or ninth round with Salido, it he he went to jabbing like, oh Lord, like Jesus. I don't know if I don't know. No, you know, the no. Miora fight was some people feel stopped a little early, but look, he knows as well as we know. You can't look. Don't be Salido. Salido's not a human. I just don't think the guy likes these. Well, I think he needs. He <laughs> understands it. I, I'm. I promise you. I, I think he gets into him and says, "I'm gonna do. I'll do you." But when when it's showing that a guy is not willing to be outdone, and that's Salido. Uh, Miora was not willing to be outdone either. He just got waved off. But he, he did. Eighth and ninth round, you see him coming out, and he's like, move to the left, jab, jab, jab. Move to the left again, jab, jab, jab. Salito's like, no, sir, not tonight. We've been doing this. We're going to keep doing it. So I think he, that right there, him and his coaches need to get together and say, look, man, you got skills. You know how to roll punches. You know how to change this, do the shit, because you, 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 don't, you don't like this, man. Let's go. Wait, 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 wait a minute. I'm gonna say let's get Daniel and Jacob in the conversation. First, you Daniel. Wait, wait a minute. No. Like no, you, you just proved you just proved Bo's point though. You just proved Bo's against point scores easy. He jabs, but when the fight is presented to him, he fights. That's yeah, the main point of Francisco Vargas. That's the thing. It doesn't, it's not that he likes it. He'd rather box you. He would rather box you, but if you give him a fight, he's just gonna smile and fight back. That's why. Well, I, that's why I compared him. Second, go ahead. No, that's I said. That's why I compared him as a younger version of Salido, because Salido yeah. had some skills too. But then he knew what was best for him. Well, and in the last fight, first of all, the cuts took place in the fifth round. Uh, his corner, you know, I, I, do credit to Vargas's corner. They have really got it down, and how can how to best control. <laughs> Yeah. His cuts. I mean, they are the best in the business, honest to God. I don't know how they got him through that last fight. Well, and, and part of the issue with Salito is, you know, Salito fights with lefts, rights, and his head. And we all know it. And he, he is the master of dirty tricks, and he is the master of getting away with them. So when you're being a guy you know, from three directions, not just two, it makes you mad. <laughs> and what are you going to do? You, you, with a guy, with an opponent like that in front of you, you can't really outskill him. And Vargas was doing his best to just try to end things. In fact, after he got cut in the fifth round, he tagged Salito in the sixth round. How in the world Salito stayed on his feet, I still could never explain to you. Because he's not I, I there you go. Exactly. There you go. He's, a, you know, he's the son of the alien Hopkins. I don't know, illegitimate kid or something. It's a golem. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. So faced with an opponent like that, yeah, it's just nuts. Now, you know, if that's the kind of guy that comes after him and the same scenario presents, you know, there's damage to the face. He starts feeling the pressure. He starts trying to get a guy out of there and next thing you know it's just wall to wall and the noise roars up from the fans and here we go yeah, he and, don't even. and he and he knows they love it he is he is he tends to fight in fairly small venues the Cotto Canelo undercard was sort of an exception and he he feels them and hears them right up on top of him. He's definitely one of those guys. I wouldn't even call those cuts. I, I'll say what Bernie Mac used to say. 
Uh, but I'm going to say red meat. He gives beat to the red meat. Them ain't cuts. Them is patches. <laughs> well, I, I'm just going to say yeah. that. That's crazy. Yeah. Well, oh, I, yeah. How they're kept under control, I have no exactly. idea. I mean, I his know, corner yeah. works magic. Yeah, uh, that, that corner is insane. That corner is insane. But let, let's give let's give props to Berter on this sense. Like, there's a, like that punching power is real. And quite frankly, th remember, there is a reason why Rocky Martinez chose to rematch with Salido over Belcher. And it wasn't money. Because right. we saw because we saw what Lomachenko did to Rocky Martinez. That probably would have been worse for Belcher. The problem with Belcher though is like I said, he is a little bit robotic. And if you're a little bit robotic, you can be easy pickings for a boxer. Because he can memorize you, he can time you, and he'll know when you when you want to counter. He'll just escape. Uh, let's get Jacob in this, uh, into the discussion here. Your thoughts on on this fight with Vargas and Belichick? I think it has the potential to be a really good fight. Um, I mean, everybody's kind of pointing out the obvious about um, Vargas. My my concerns with Vargas is, you know. Great. I, I know he likes to entertain the fans, and we love him for it. And but you know, <laughs> he would be wiser for career long longevity, longevity that if he he fought a little bit smarter. Because you know, you can only go through so many wars before you start to you know get broken down. Um. So ho hopefully, it's a good good fight. I, I think I think it'll you know. I think Vargas can stop him, but it, it'll probably go on to like eight or nine rounds. I think he's conscious of his place in the division and the potential uh, round robin of fights between him, Mura, Salido, um, Lomachenko, all just right there. Um, and as I think it was Gail that pointed out, Mura will be watching, and I know he wants that rematch. Uh, one of the, you know, Mura was actually supposed to fight Salido on the Hopkins undercard. But I believe Salido got hurt uh, in training, so I, we we would have been had something you know nice there. But uh, you know Vargas, I think will will be a little bit smarter um, and be able to uh, capitalize on uh, Burchett and be able to you know hopefully stop him. Uh, I'll say like ninth, tenth round. Uh, wait, wait, wait. You, the the name of Takashi Miura has been mentioned a couple of times within the discussion about uh, Vargas and his upcoming fight. Uh, Miura is fighting on the undercard against uh, Miguel Roman. Um, and anybody can jump in on this conversation. Um, how much, how tough of a fight is Miura in for um, against Roman for folks who know anything about Miguel Roman? I don't think it's that tough of a fight compared to what Vargas is faced with. I really don't think it's that tough of a fight compared to what Vargas skate escape with. The the thing about Kashi <clears throat> Mura is he's another one of those uh, guys. Listen, he's highly motivated because he felt like if the, the, he felt like the fight could have went either way. Because remember, there was one point where he was on top of Vargas, and I I, I say it is if, if any other referee would have been in that Mura Vargas fight. Mira probably would have won that fight because there was a moment when he was hitting Vargas with some hard shots and you just you was thinking to yourself at any moment, the ref just going to jump in there. He's just going to jump in there and stop it. But he, you know, he didn't, he kept going. And I think Mira looks at that. Um, but no, he's not in a, in a, in a very toughest fight as Vargas is the guy he's fighting Roman. He, you know, he has, you know, he has 11 losses. Uh, he's only been knocked out once. So most of his fights have, have come because of decision. He, now, he also is another one of them dudes with a pretty, I think, 68% or 70% knockout ratio. But uh, he's also one of those guys. It's not that he's robotic. He's just easy to figure out. Like, he's just one of those guys that if you can just figure out what he's doing, and he, he does the same thing repeatedly sometimes, even in rounds. So I think Muir should have the ring intelligence to, you know, to catch on to this and figure it out. And if he wants to make a statement, run this guy over. But I think it's excellent to have the guy that could be potentially your next opponent on the undercard because that's what builds fights. I mean, that's what they did with Bondu Jack and James DeGale. They was always on each other's undercards and, and then they finally fought each other. So I I like it, but I, I don't think Mira is in for a 
a harder task as Vargas. He can make it hard. He can make it hard, but it shouldn't be. Um, anybody else with comments on this fight? Couldn't agree more with what Bo said. I, I, I do think it's going to be an easier fight for Mira. I think that he he wants that that second chance. And I think what Bo was talking about was that sixth round when I think Mira actually knocked him down and, and it looked like they, the fight was going to be over. Um, but, you know, I think they've, they've done a good job to, you know, put them on the undercards, as, as Bo was talking about, or put them on the same card because it creates, you know, excitement. It creates a rivalry and, you know, it's a chance for both of them to get another fight in before potentially they can fight each other. Um, kind of like the, the Lee Selby, uh, Frampton situation. Um, you know, if you can have a bunch of fighters uh, within the same division fight on, on the same card and then, you know, winners, winners fight each other and maybe the losers, you know, fight for, you know, third, third uh, pick, then, you know, it's, it's good to kind of like mix it up that way, I think. Yeah, I, I don't think I, I think Roman will present um, enough of a challenge for Mura to get some work in. Um, he's one of these guys. He's had you know sixty five fights. I think this is his sixty fifth fight, and he's only thirty one years old. You know, he's one of these Mexican fighters who started as a professional when he was sixteen or seventeen years old. Um, He's had the lion's share of his fights in Mexico. He's had a few quality opponents. Um, he's uh, uh, faced uh, uh, Miguel Beltran. Na I'm pulling out names people would know. Miguel Beltran, um, Jorge Solis, one of his opponents, um, uh, Jonathan Barrios, as we uh, commented on. Uh, he fought and lost to Javier Fortuna. Uh, in 2011, uh, that was one of his rare fights uh, north of the border. That was in Las Vegas. Uh, Antonio DeMarco, as we mentioned, um, his, his last loss, though, was three years, uh, no, five years ago to Dante Jarden, um, who I don't know. So he's he's got a great record. Uh, he's, he's a stay-busy guy. Um, Last year was actually one of his lighter years. He had three fights in 2016, but believe it or not, in 2015, the guy had five fights. So <laughs> he's a busy dude. He he works hard for the money, that's for sure. I'll hand it to him. Um, it'll be an entertaining fight, but I really think Mira's going to have an easier time in his fight than Vargas will in his. Um, I, I think so as well, and we're going to start to shut the show down. Um, I think that Muir is going to be very fairly impressive here. I think he's going to stop Roman um, mid to late rounds. Uh, as far as, as Vargas, I think he will have an easier fight with an easier fight with Burchuk than he has against uh, either Muir or Salido. But because uh, Vargas can't help himself, um, it's going to be action packed. I, I I just think the fact that he is uh, skilled to to Scorsese's point, uh, Burchuk. He can be robotic. I think Vargas will take advantage of that. Uh, the advantage of skill with the power that Vargas has will produce uh, a win in this case. Um, I think he's going to stop Birch Elch, uh mid to late rounds as well. And he was going to set up what I think is going to be a rematch probably later on, probably summer, early fall uh, uh, between these two. Uh, it's just my opinion. Um, well, I did, well, I, and, the, and the big dream show that we all want to see is uh, Vargas and Mira rematch and Lomachenko Salido rematch on the undercard at the Stuff Hub, Jacob. And you know, <laughs> I just, that is just the craziest dream match for any of us fans in Southern California. We just go winners, so winners bad. fight winners and losers fight losers. Yeah, exactly. I do want to. Quickly, though, although these are not televised fights, uh, quite a few names were added to the um, Vargas and Mira undercard. Toriano Johnson, yep. middleweight, uh, is coming back after a long layoff due to recovering from injury. He was originally um, Gennady Golovkin's mandatory after he won on the undercard of Golovkin Lemieux back in 2015. Uh, before he got injured, so he is back in action. 
Saddam Ali is fighting on the undercard. Uh, Lamont Roach, a super featherweight prospect, is fighting. He's undefeated. Um, and we also have a couple of uh, Golden Boy's other named prospects um, added. I mean, it is a lengthy card. Anybody who can get there within a couple hour drive and doesn't have tickets, um, you might want to think about it. It's really a good a card and it'll be a nice night, nice event. And I think we're going to uh, shut the show down on that note. We're going to make this a, a quicker show um, than, we, we, than what we usually do. I'm going to go around the hangout, around the panel here. Um, ladies first, as always, Yale Falk with all the communities, digital news. For folks who want to talk to Sweet Science or anything else, let the folks know where they can find you. Well, you can certainly find me this weekend online. I will be in Indio covering that card um, while I'm probably watching a stream of what's going on in Las Vegas. If there was ever a weekend for picture in picture on your TV, this is it. And you can find me at Communities Digital News. That's where my preview columns will run, I think, starting tomorrow morning. And that is com, C-O-M-M, digi, D-I-G-I news, com, digi-news.com. On social media, I'm at PR Pro San Diego. Love to talk fights. I also participate in quite a few of the larger closed Facebook groups that talk boxing. Uh, if he's still awake, because I know he's doing this live from the UK, um, EJ Boxing Live. For folks who want to talk to Sweet Science uh, or anything else, let, let the folks know where they can find you. Uh, oh, you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Oh yeah, yeah, um, yeah. EJ walks it live on Instagram, and um, you can catch me on Twitter, and also my YouTube channel, EJ Walks It Live. There, um, videos, updates of like debates and just talking, all talking boxing stuff. So you can catch me there. Yeah, I want to thank EJ especially because I, I know he can't be on every week, and when he's on, it's usually early, early, middle yeah. night <laughs> there. Because like I said, he joins us live from England. I know it's not the easiest thing to stay up that that late um, to join us up. So I want to thank him again for joining us um, and whenever he can. Um, both from Truth and Facts and Boxing. Uh, for folks who want to talk to Sweet Science or anything else, let the folks know where they can hit you up. Oh, they can find me at uh, Truth, capital T for Truth, underscore, capital F for Fact, Box 1 on Twitter. And on Instagram, it's just Truth, underscore, Fact, bo- uh, Truth, underscore, Fact, Box 1. You can also catch me in the movement uh, uh, podcast with me, um, 2K the God from the Gods of Boxing, my partner in crime, Bernard, a.k.a. Brave, Big Cool from uh, Colossal Boxing Talk, and Twan Levity from Hoop Jab and Boxing Scene. Um, we, call it, we call it the movement. We do a podcast every Sunday, uh, 724, 724-744-4444. And uh, any any room that they talk boxing in, like EJ Boxing Live, you can catch me in there all a lot of times talking with old crazy EJ. And uh, any other room that they be talking boxing, that's where you can find me right here on Pound for Pound. I just want to say, as always, it is a pleasure, and I'm privileged to be here with all of these minds talking boxing. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Hope to have you on as often as we can. Um, I want to thank uh, Joe and Francis. They were on for, for a brief moment. Um, they were having uh, technical issues on their end. Um, if you want to check them out, just uh, follow them on Twitter at 4 Boxing News, at the number 4 Boxing News, all one word, if you want to check out their site. Um, the number 4 Boxing News.com is where you can find um, them. Uh, uh, Jacob Rivera uh, from Jab Hook Boxing. For folks who want to talk to Sweet Science or anything else, let the folks know where they can find you. Yeah, it can be found at uh, Twitter at JRATM23 or jabhookboxing.com. I uh, wanted to give, uh, like always, shout out to Michael. Thanks for having me on the show. Um, support the show. Give it a review. You know, tell your friends, uh, knowledgeable people on the show that know their stuff and that uh, are respectful and, and, you know, not knocking other shows out there. But uh, it's one of the things that I like the most is that uh, we can – we can respectfully disagree and, and, you know, and everybody's, you know, cool about it and, you know, no slander uh, things going on, going on about that. And uh, shout out to uh, Jay Dill. I know he sometimes gets on the show, but he does, he has his own YouTube channel. He's been putting out some good content and a lot of content. So, uh, you know, give him a follow. He's got some good stuff out there. Uh, Daniel Caprio, the inscriber for folks who want to talk 
um, the Sweet Science or the NBA, specifically the Miami Heat. Um, let the folks know where they can find you. Hello, folks. Uh, you can find me at Ruckus99 on Twitter. I also just say do my own little podcast with, the, with Joe and Francis for Boxing News. Uh, this week we did have Bo as a guest. And like I said, we talked about this week's fights and another boxing news. Definitely catches in hopefully on Sunday or Monday where we catch up with the weekend with some of these fights going on. And maybe we'll see some other little news coming up because we missed a lot of things, actually. But we know it's a short show, but hopefully we'll definitely get a pop in this week. And finally, Scott, Scorsese, uh, for folks who want to talk boxing or anything else, let the folks know where to hit you up. Uh, yeah, Twitter. My Twitter is at, at my low place, one word, and my YouTube is low place, hashtag MLPF. Just talk yeah, he about remembered it whoever wanted. Looking, right <laughs> looking right at it. Um, that was a lot of fours by Bo. I never heard so many fours in my life. That was crazy, but yeah, um, follow me on Twitter, talk boxing, whoever want to talk it, man. That's all I talk about on that, just about. And um, for folks who want to um, talk the sweet science or music or anything else with me, you know what it is, Brother JR on Twitter, at Brother JR76. And as I stated earlier in the show, if you want to talk, find out all things Pound for Pound Boxing Report about that, just go to the blog page, p4pboxingreport.wordpress.com with the link. Uh, once again, if you go to the right of the page, um, you can find links to find our pages on um, Facebook, G+, Tumblr, as well as links to where you can listen to us on SoundCloud, iTunes, uh, Player.fm, Stitcher Radio, Google Play Music, um, probably a couple other places where I'm forgetting right now. Um, next episode, Pound for Pound Box Report, we will do a recap of Frampton Santa Cruz rematch. Um, Zalata Kanin and Mikey Garcia, as well as Selby and Barrios. Also do a recap of the fights we just talked about, Vargas and Berlchich, uh, Tsukashi Mira, Miguel Roman. And um, we will do a preview uh, for the return of um, Felix Verdejo. Um, long layoff in the ring due to a car accident. Uh, we will preview his upcoming fight. And um, I know this fight has gotten a lot of shade, but we're going to do a preview, uh, talk about Chris Eubank Jr. and his upcoming fight, not just as much the fight itself, but all the backdrop of it with, with uh, you, the Eubanks and trying to make a power play and calling out the powers that be um, vis-a-vis um, UK boxing. Um, if you can make it, EJ, um, I would love to have you on that show because I want to get your insight on on that aspect of this fight, that backdrop um, for the the back that backstory regarding the um, Eubanks you bank junior in that fight so i'd love to have your in- input on that your insight on that oh. your thoughts on that so. yeah i should be i should yeah i should be around still so we will talk about so we'll re- replay all the stuff we went down this weekend I'll, and we will also preview the return of verdejo the fight with you bank junior so yeah this is 155 episode 155 of the pound pound box report for kill of community digital news uh for francis and joe for boxing news for ej boxing live uh daniel daniel of uh, the inscriber Jacob from Jack of Boxing, Scorsese, both from Truth and Fact and Boxing. I am your host, Michael. Uh, we will see you next week. Uh, everybody, have a good evening, good night. A quick note for boxing fans. I know Cecilia Brackus was supposed to fight uh, on Saturday. That fight got rescheduled for uh, February 24th, so just in case. Because uh, uh, she, she got the flu. <laughs> yeah. Uh, good, good looking out. Good looking out. Thanks uh, for the update. And one note on my end, I uh, want to give a big uh, shout out, big congratulations to Raquel Miller, uh, 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 women boxer f- um, out of San Francisco. She fought over the weekend. She's now 3-0. and uh, We talk about Clarissa Shields and we talk about Katie Taylor uh, um, and all these other uh, women fighters. Um, what's the lady who uh, just turned pro over in England, um, EJ? To what, Nicola Adams? Nicola Adams, we talk about her as well. Uh, Raquel Miller, she's a really uh, uh, good-looking prospect, and I ain't talking about um, not just in terms of her beauty as well, because she's a good-looking woman, but she can also fight, too. I think she's highly skilled. Early, early guest the Pound for Pound Box Report. She just won this weekend by stoppage, so I want to give a big shout-out to her. So, again, nice. episode 155 of the Pound for Pound Box Report. I want to thank everybody for joining me this week. Everybody have a good evening. Good night. Good night. Stay safe. Good night.